Mount Zion Church, so good to be here to study the Word of God. So glad that you have joined us again. We are studying the book of 2 Corinthians, verse by verse by verse. You can find all of our Bible studies on our website, mzpraise, P-R-A-Y-S dot org. Click Bible study, and you'll find them all. We've studied a number of books now in the Bible, uh, verse by verse by verse. We're asking God to speak to our hearts. Uh, the new studies appear on the website and on the church Facebook page, and I put them up on my Facebook page. Every Monday at 7 p.m. is the new study. You can look at them, of course, on Facebook or the website anytime. So we're going to pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we come to it again and again and again because, Lord, you have told us and we have discovered it is a living word. You speak to our hearts. You give us strength. You give us wisdom. You reach to those deepest places within us as we go to your word. And so, Lord, we're asking that you would do exactly that now as we read here together today. And, Lord, we lift up our hearts to you. We pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, we are in chapter 5 at verse 1. In the book of 2 Corinthians, we have seen this is a letter that that man named Paul wrote to a congregation, a group of Christians in the city of Corinth in the Roman Empire in that first century. Paul, you remember, was a missionary going from place to place through the Roman Empire telling people about Jesus. In many of the places where he went, congregations were formed. He was very often the first person in the city or the town to ever be there talking about Jesus. So usually he would stay short periods of time in each place and then go to the next place. He would establish a congregation and then move on. In Corinth, he stayed for a couple of years. And so he became, in essence, their pastor, their shepherd there in Corinth. Then he moved on. The occasion of this letter, the reason he wrote this letter, was primarily in response to one situation. He's now moved on. He's not in Corinth anymore. He hears about what's going on back in Corinth. And one of the things that was happening that was most troubling was that there was a group of persons, and particularly one person, who was talking trash about Paul. This person wanted to be like the leader of the church, and he was jealous of the affection the people of Corinth had for Paul, and so that man started to say a whole lot about Paul, but the main kind of trash talking he did was saying, look at all the problems that Paul has had in his life and continues to have. Uh, this guy said, that's proof. He was no man of God. He doesn't know how to pray. He doesn't have the faith that you think he has. If he was a man of God, if he knew how to pray, if he had faith, he wouldn't have all those problems. And so Paul writes this long letter primarily in response to that. And we've said a number of times, when you're reading these letters that you find in the New Testament, many of the books in the New Testament, as they're called, were letters, and it's, you're reading it like you're hearing one side of a phone call. You're sitting in a restaurant, somebody at the next table is talking on the phone, all you can hear is what that person is saying. You can't hear what the person on the other end of the line is saying. But if you listen carefully, often you can kind of figure out, if you're listening to your neighbor's uh, conversation, you can figure out what the other person is saying, and that's what we do here to better understand these letters. So Paul responds to all this because if the people of Corinth come to believe that a real person of God, a person who really has faith, a person who really prays, won't have big problems, well, then they've swallowed a big lie because that simply is not true. Jesus himself said to his disciples, in this world you will have tribulation, huge trouble. And then he went on to say, Jesus went on to say, but be of good cheer. In other words, have courage, have joy nevertheless. I have overcome the world. He's saying, and in me, you will overcome the world. In other words, the troubles that you have in this life, the struggles, the hardships, the pain, the hurt, the disappointments will not destroy you. You will overcome them. And so Paul writes this letter back to the church in Corinth saying all these things. He's not like fighting for his reputation, right? He's moved on. 
but he is speaking for truth, for this truth about the reality of struggles and difficulties in our lives. And he has a whole lot to say about it, and if you haven't been doing this study with us, go back and listen to the studies and, and read these first four chapters here. He has a lot to say about that, and he's continuing here in chapter 5 at verse 1. And where we're picking it up here now is where he talks about death. In other words, when I die, even that won't defeat me. Jesus has overcome even the power of death. So Paul, you know, faced death many times as the, the hatred and the racism of the Roman Empire came against him. Uh, many times he was beaten, sometimes almost to the point of death. Remember, he was thrown into the lion's den. The Romans would throw their prisoners in the lion's den for entertainment for their people, right? Paul faced death many times. He, he certainly had a lot of physical struggles. We'll read later in this letter, he had a thorn in the flesh, as he called it, a physical affliction. And so he's talking here now about the huge troubles we face in this life and even death. So let's pick it up here at verse 1 in chapter 5. He says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So he says, we know that if, this, if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, our body. So we know that if they take our lives, if disease, if accident takes my life, if my earthly body is destroyed, what does he say? We have a building from God, a house not made with hands. We have a spiritual body, a spiritual body that God will give to us, right? We live, we have, right, a spirit, a soul, uh, a, a body, right? Uh, your soul is your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings, your memories. Uh, your, your spirit is that deepest place within you, that place that connects with God, uh, the place that is life itself. It's the place of the will. In other words, this is what I will do deeper than the thoughts of your brain. And then, of course, we have our physical bodies. So here Paul is saying that when our physical bodies die, right, we will have a new home, a house. It's like our physical bodies are the house of our spirit, our soul, right? And here he's saying we'll have a new house, a new building, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We will have a spiritual body. So he goes on at verse 2. He says, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. He's saying, yeah, living in these physical bodies now, we have the, the aches, the pains, the diseases, right, the weaknesses of our physical bodies. And he says, in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. Yeah, we, we look to that day, right, when we will no longer have the, the pain, the hurt, the disease of these physical bodies. Now, when Paul here talks about, you know, we, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, it seems to me he's talking about our physical bodies, but Paul doesn't, like, just completely separate body, soul, spirit, right? Uh, he, he's saying we long to be with the Lord. We long for everything in us, for the, a new spiritual body, but everything in us to be well and right and at peace. We, we long for that day when we're no longer tormented by the physical pain of this world, the emotional pain of this world, by uh, all the, the struggles, whether they're physical, emotional, spiritual of this world. We're longing for that day. We look to that day, right, when we will see Jesus face to face, when all the, the struggles of this world uh, will be over uh, so that, you know, the uh, prophet Isaiah said, sorrow and sighing will flee away and everlasting joy will be upon us. He says, we long for that day. He, he, at verse 3, look what he says. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. <laughs> what, is, what does that mean? 
Well, so he's picturing, he keeps kind of changing his metaphors here. Um, uh, 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 English teacher might say, uh, Paul, you're mixing your metaphors. He goes from one metaphor to another. He talks about our bodies as um, uh, a building. Uh, he talks about uh, a dwelling. And now he, he talks about our physical bodies like clothing. If indeed by putting it on, by putting on this spiritual body, we may not be found naked. So naked means uh, for an ancient a person in ancient Rome, shameful. So uh, a Roman army might strip, if when they conquer an enemy, they might strip the enemy of their clothing and march them through the city naked, showing their weakness, the shamefulness of uh, their defeat, s- saying to the city that was trusting in their soldiers, Your soldier, you can't trust in your soldiers. They're nothing. Look at them. We have stripped them naked. We've defeated them. They couldn't stand against us. And so here's Paul, the apostle, saying, look, we long for that day when we will stand before God, not ashamed of ourselves. When we will stand before God, not uh, in defeat. When we will stand before God, not in the weaknesses of our physical bodies, but in the weaknesses of our soul, right? In the the weaknesses of our life in this world. We're looking to that day when we will stand before God, right? Cleansed, uh, his work complete in us. What does the scripture say? That he who began a good work in you, Jesus who when you put your faith in him, you repented, you turned away from the sinfulness of the world, you turned to Jesus. He who began a good work in you, he began that good work in you, he will bring it to completion. On that moment when you open your eyes and you you look into Jesus' eyes, right, and you stand before him then, that work in you is completed. So you won't stand before him ashamed. You won't stand before him in defeat. Now, those who pridefully, arrogantly say, I don't need a savior. I don't need a God telling me how to live. I don't need mercy. I don't need forgiveness. Yes, they will be stripped naked. The the arrogance and the pridefulness and the selfishness of their heart will be all they have to clothe themselves with, and it will be nothing. They will stand shamefully before God. They will stand defeated by their own pridefulness and arrogance before God. And here's the Apostle Paul saying, yeah, you know what? The Romans might arrest me. They might strip me naked and set me before the crowd as if I would stand there ashamed. He said, I will not stand before anyone ashamed. I will not stand before God ashamed because God in his mercy, God in his grace, God in his goodness is clothing me with righteousness, is clothing me with his goodness. He will clothe me with even a new body, a physical body. And more than that, he will clothe me with his righteousness, his goodness. Wow. You know, whenever we read these letters, we always have to keep in mind the situation of those first followers of Jesus living in that Roman Empire. Tiny minority, hated by their neighbors, because the Christians, the followers of Jesus, were were doing what we all in Jesus know is right and good, but the people in the way they thought, thought that was wicked and evil. The care for orphans, the care for special needs children, to go beyond the racism and the hatreds of this world and actually love one another. All their neighbors thought they were crazy, wicked. Everyone said, bow down, worship the emperor. And the Christians wouldn't do it, right? And they wouldn't live like everyone else was living. And so when we read these letters, even that right there, In that verse 3, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked, we always have to think about the situation of those first Christians. Yeah, they might round us up one day, arrest us, strip us naked, march us through the city. And here's Paul saying, we won't be ashamed on that day. We will not be ashamed when we stand before God. They will be ashamed in their pridefulness and their arrogance when they stand before God. We will not be ashamed. And so at verse 4 then, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. 
So again, he uses this word groan. While we are still in this tent, we groan. He says being burdened. Yeah, he's talking about our physical bodies, burdened with the, the pain and the hurt and the, the you know, gradual falling apart of our bodies as we age. Uh, Paul, having been beaten again and again, many of those first followers of Jesus enduring all kinds of even physical persecution against them. So yeah, burdened with all of that. But burdened with this reality, we all know, that we are a work in process. Jesus has begun the work in us. That work will be completed when we see him face to face. Right? And so we're burdened with the working out, as Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Right? With the working out of our salvation. We're, we're burdened to keep pressing on. We're burdened to keep learning how to rely not on ourselves but on him. We're burdened with keep, having to keep learning how to, to live by the spirit and not by our flesh, right? Uh, to learn how to overcome the temptations and the distractions and the fears and the worries and all the mess of this world. So yeah, we, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, we're not living in fear that we will stand before God ashamed, right? Stand before God defeated. We're not living in fear of that. We know that we have humbled ourselves and cried out for Jesus, to Jesus for salvation, for mercy. We know the forgiveness of sin that has come to our lives. We know that we have this assurance that we will stand before him that because we've humbled ourselves, put our faith in Jesus, turned to him, he has not blotted our name out of that book of life, we will stand before him and live. We will be received. So he says, not burdened, that, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. That he would continue that work in us. That he would continue that good work he began in us, clothing us with his righteousness. In other words, clothing us with love. In other words, teaching us how to love and to love and to love. He would clothe us with uh, his goodness, with kindness, with compassion, with all the, the fruit, as Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit. Right? He would clothe us with his character, with his goodness, that we would be further clothed, and then ultimately that he would clothe us with a new body even, a spiritual body, not a physical body subject to the pain and the hurt of this world says that, that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. That what will die in this world will be swallowed up by the life that Jesus, that our Father brings to us. In other words, we know that we will go not to death. We are not heading to hell. We will stand before God then clothed in his righteousness, clothed even with a new spiritual body. We will stand before God and live. We've humbled ourselves. We've put our faith in what he did for us there on that cross, that we have this assurance that when we stand before him, he will not say, depart from me, depart from me, but rather that he will welcome us into his kingdom. And so he says that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Look at verse 5. He says, he who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. It is God himself who is preparing for us, and he even says here, who has prepared for us. In other words, although we're still experiencing it as an ongoing process in our lives, right, outside of time, it's a done deal. God, who exists outside of time, has already prepared us for this very thing, to stand before him, to welcome us into his kingdom, right? So he says, the God who has done this has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So our Father has already poured out his Spirit upon us. He's already poured the Holy Spirit into our hearts when we humble ourselves before him, when we put our faith in Jesus, when we open the door of our hearts to him, he comes to our lives. The Father sends the Holy Spirit. God himself 
So the one God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This one God comes to our lives, right, and brings to us uh, his wisdom, his strength. In other words, God is now at work in us, creating the character of Jesus in our lives, bringing, as Paul said, the fruit of the Spirit, bringing the goodness of Jesus to our character, renewing us, remaking us. We're reborn, right? We become a new person as now the presence of God is within us. So at verse 6 then, what does he say? So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. So he says, so we're always of good courage. So we know when we die, next moment we'll be standing before God. Next moment we'll be standing before God. All will be well. We'll be standing before God clothed in his righteousness. We'll be standing before God, not ashamed, not defeated, not cussing him out, right? Now, the question, of course, is, have you humbled yourself before him? Have you repented, turned to Jesus and put your faith in him? Have you humbly asked for forgiveness? Have you humbly asked him to teach you how to live? Have you humbly submitted your life to him, knowing him as your savior and knowing him as your Lord, your king, your God. That's the question for us. If I have turned to him, put my faith in him, humbled myself before him, asked for forgiveness and mercy, asked him, in other words, to be my savior and submitted myself to him as my Lord, then I have this good courage that I'm not afraid of whatever this life is. Uh, may throw at me, whatever this world may throw at me, I'm not afraid to die. I have good courage if I've turned to Jesus, right? So he says, we know there still in that verse six that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. We can't see him now with our eyes, right? We can't, no preacher, nobody can prove any of this to us. Right? I can't prove anything I'm saying here to you. Right? And yet, we have good courage. And yet, we know it's true. How do you know something's true that cannot be proven? How do you know it? I know in my heart this is true. I know that in my heart. So he says, look, while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. Look at verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. I know this word is true. I know it's true by faith. Faith is knowing, believing, though I have not seen. By faith, not by sight. I can't see Jesus. I can't see the truths of his word. I can't prove it in any laboratory. But by faith, I not only believe, but know. I not only believe, but know this is true. And so um, somebody say, well, well, wait a minute. Uh, You're just saying you choose to believe. Yeah, it's a choice. And when you make the choice, when you choose to believe, when you choose to put your faith in what Jesus did for you there on that cross, when you choose to put your faith in all that he says to us in his word, what happens is he proves, he proves himself true in our lives again and again and again. I can't prove to myself that this is true, but he proves himself true in our lives. He has proved himself true in my life again and again and again and again. Now, now let's remember here what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, look, look, man, I, yeah, you're right. I've been through after trouble, after trouble, after problem, after problem, after problem. He's saying, yeah, I've had massive trouble in my life. So the proof of the truth of Jesus is not that he'll put some magic bubble around you and keep all the problems and the troubles and the pain and the hurt of life away. 
But he will prove himself true to you by giving you the wisdom, the strength, the determination, the courage to overcome whatever the world throws at you, whatever troubles you encounter. And you say, well, Pastor Craig, lots of people overcome whether they have faith in Jesus or not. Yeah, so what do I mean by overcome? What did Jesus mean by overcome? What he meant was not just that he got through it, not just that he survived, right, through it. What he meant was that he overcame, right, the temptation to say, I'm not going to love you. You hate me, I'll hate you. He overcame the temptation to hate those who were hating him. He overcame the temptation to say, forget about y'all, I'm just going to take care of me. Because, man, they didn't deserve him. They didn't deserve Jesus to love them after all that they did to him. I mean, he was dying on the cross as they're cussing him out still. He's dying on the cross. They've stripped him naked, hanging there on the cross. You know, in the paintings, they have a little cloth across his midsection, right? They stripped their prisoners naked as they hung him on the cross. They stripped him naked. They had beaten him severely to the point of death. Now he's hanging on a cross. They're still mocking him, ridiculing him. And what does Jesus do? Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. When Jesus said, I have overcome the world... He meant that he was, despite everything coming against him, despite all the physical pain, the emotional pain, all the wickedness of the world coming against him, he was still living the calling that God put, that the Heavenly Father put on his life. See, Jesus proves himself to us by giving us the strength, the courage, the love, the kindness, the compassion, the determination to live according to this incredibly high calling that he's put on our lives. In other words, as the Bible said, to be holy as he is holy, to love as he loves, to be kind as he is kind, to be compassionate as he is compassionate, despite everything that would make me say, forget it, I just got to take care of myself. Or why should I love them? Why should I be compassionate to them? So Jesus proves, we live by faith. I can't prove it to myself. I can't prove it to you. But if you will put your faith in him, if you will put your faith in Jesus, if you will submit your life to him as your king, as your Lord, right, then he will prove himself true by being at work in your heart, by being at work deep inside of you so that you, so that you will No, you will know. It's Jesus at work in me. I could have never, I could never have continued to love after all that happened to me. I could never have continued to to bless after all that's happened to me. Jesus will prove himself true to you again and again and again. And yes, one day you will see him face to face. One day, yes, you will know beyond faith, beyond him proving himself to you now, you will see him with your eyes face to face. But now we live by faith. We walk, which means we walk by faith, he says, which means we live moment by moment, hour by hour, by faith, not by sight. So look at verse 8. Yes, we are of, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He says, yeah, he says, we are of good courage. He says, I have courage. I've got the courage of knowing that Jesus is with me every step of the way. Whatever happens to me in this world, he'll never abandon me. I have the courage of knowing that the end of the story belongs to him and it's great. I have the courage to continue to love as he has loved me, to forgive as he has forgiven me. He says, we are of good courage. We have good courage knowing all of these things. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He's saying, yeah, I would, rather than being here, I would certainly rather be with him. 
I would rather be with him. I wouldn't have to deal with the hurts, the disappointments, the, the pain, the, the struggles of life in this world. I have good courage. I'd rather be with him, but I've got good courage now. And so he continues his thought at verse 9. He says, so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. So I'm not there yet, but I make it my aim to please him, to please him. I make it my aim in this world and then beyond this life to please, to obey my God. I make it my aim to hear on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. I make it my aim to stay humble before God now. I make it my aim to humbly obey God now, to humbly trust God now. That's my goal. That's my aim in life. If you're looking, hey, by the way, you're looking for uh, a life verse one little verse of scripture that you maybe put in your wallet and hold on to, uh, that might be one right there. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. That's my goal, to please God, to do what God wants me to do, to search out his word, to search out his will for my life and to live according to it. That's my aim. That's my goal. You know, uh, a whole lot of people... I guess most people through the history of the world, their, their goal, their aim is the pursuit of happiness, right? Yeah, you know what? You, you can chase after it and chase after it and chase after it, and you'll never catch it. Or you'll catch it, and then it'll be gone from you in a moment. Make it your aim, make it your goal to pursue Jesus. In other words, make it your aim to obey him, to please him. And then joy, joy will come. If I make my goal to have happiness, to have joy, right? If that's my goal, I'll never get it. It'll always disappear from me. But if I make it my aim in this world with all the hurt and the pain and the disappointments of this life, if I make it my aim to please God, then the joy comes in the midst of the pain and the difficulty and the hard circumstances of life. And I have the joy of knowing that even now as the joy is mixed with pain and hurt in this world, that day is coming when sorrow and sign will flee away and everlasting joy will be upon me. So, yeah, that's, that's an incredible verse right there. Uh, you know, we make it our aim to please him. What does Jesus want me to do right now? What does Jesus want me to do in this situation? What would Jesus have done in the same situation that I'm in today, right now. And you know, when you read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible and read the Bible, more and more you know what Jesus would have done. More and more you know how Jesus would have handled the situation that you're facing. And so then we ask our question, what would he have done? What does he want me to do right now, right here? We make it our aim to please him. So at verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We will stand before Jesus. We will all stand before Jesus. Now, as we come to this verse, we could go into a very long study at this moment of everything the Bible says about that day of judgment. We know that the whole earth will stand before God, that everyone who has ever lived on the face of this earth will be resurrected. We will all be raised up and stand before God. In the book of Revelation, it says, and the books will be opened the record of the deeds of our lives. The books will be opened. All the things that have been hidden will be known. All the things, as Jesus said, that have been whispered in private rooms will be shouted on the housetops. And let me put a little parenthesis. That doesn't just refer to that day of judgment. That refers to now. Secrets come out now. 
hidden things are always revealed even now, right? They all come out. But on that day, everything will be known. So uh, we read, right, the books will be opened, and uh, it says that persons will be judged on the deeds of their lives. But then there's another book that will be opened. It says the book of life. And it says, those whose names have not been blotted out of the book of life, to them he will say, come, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. To those whose names have been blotted out of the book of life, he says, depart from me into the outer darkness. Whose names are blotted out of the book of life? Those who pridefully, arrogantly say, I don't need forgiveness, I don't need Jesus, I don't need God, I don't need a Savior, I don't need a Bible. Those, in other words, who will cause hurt and pain, right, for all eternity. And here's God saying, I'm not going to allow you, if you're going to arrogantly, pridefully reject me, arrogantly, pridefully reject everything I teach you about how to live your life well, how to love one another, I'm not going to allow you to hurt my people for all eternity. And so depart from me into the outer darkness. So we read that in the book of Revelation. Read it there, the very end of the book of Revelation, about that day of judgment. Now, what is Paul talking about here in verse 10? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So, Bible scholars have all different thoughts. Is this that same judgment as all persons standing before the Father? Bible scholars argue, or I shouldn't say argue, but debate about that, right? Is, is it that? Uh, here he specifically says before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, we know that we will stand before Christ and that no one comes to the Father except through him, right? We know that, right? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? So it is by Jesus, right, by arrogantly, pridefully rejecting him, by humbly crying out to him, asking him for forgiveness and mercy, that, that judgment, that to judge means to draw a line. That's the line. It's not, the line, by the way, isn't between good and bad. If it was between good and bad, all would be on the bad side. We're all sinners, right? We'd all be sent to the outer darkness. So it's by Christ. So he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He says, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So, yes, it is by Christ that all persons will be judged, right? Have I humbled myself before Christ or not? Now, the question for this verse is all. When Paul says, for we must all, he's writing to Christians here. My reading of this says that right here, he's talking about followers of Jesus, persons who have humbled themselves before Jesus, persons who have humbly cried out to him for mercy, who have humbly submitted himself, themselves to him as Savior and Lord. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. In other words, there are blessings that come beyond, you know, depart to the outer darkness or come inherit the kingdom that I received to you. Inherit the kingdom I received to you. There are blessings that come to those who inherit the kingdom, those who are saved, those who have received this great salvation. There are blessings that come for the good that we've done in our lives. In other words, if we have opened our hand freely to the poor and needy. The scripture is clear. God will reward that. Not just in this life, in this world, beyond this life. It's clear that God rewards obedience to him. And so it seems to me that Paul is primarily talking here about followers of Jesus then receiving not just the salvation that is in the name of Jesus, but the rewards that come from obedience to him in this life, that each one may receive what is due. So he's saying we make it our aim to please him 
we've obeyed him, right? We've, we've, we, uh, no, he, he's saying we've put our faith in him. We know we have this salvation. Now we make it our aim to please him, to receive the reward, uh, that, the rewards that come from obedience and to avoid, he says, what is due for whether he is, what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. I put my faith in him, but, and I keep my faith in him, all right? Maybe someone says, I've put my faith in Jesus. I've kept my faith in Jesus, but um, never opened a hand freely to the poor and needy, right? Uh, never reached with mercy to someone who needed mercy. Doesn't, doesn't do that. And so the reward doesn't come. Now, all this gets very... Uh, Mysterious, we might say, and Paul has some more to say about that this later in this letter. But what we can mainly take from all of this is that, as, as Jesus said, whatever man sows, that he will also reap, right? If, if whatever seeds you put in the ground, that's the, the, the harvest that you, you reap. If I plant corn, I'll reap a harvest of corn. Plant wheat, I'll reap a harvest of wheat. So if we reap what we sow... Right? If we will obey him and obey him, right? then reward, a harvest comes from that. A harvest comes from that. So Paul's saying, yeah, I, I'm seeking to, to do all. He's been so good to me. I'm seeking to do good as he's done good to me. And I know that, that the hardships and the difficulties of this life, as hard as they become, they are not worth comparing with the reward, with the blessing that is to come. You know, if you obey him, you, you, God is at work and you're, you're being equipped now. You're getting the strength. You're getting the courage. You're getting the kindness and the love to live out this calling that he's put on your life, to love as he has loved you, to forgive as he has forgiven you, to be kind as he's been kind to you. You're going to have a lot of pain and a lot of hurt that comes with that. But the blessing that is to come beyond this life is so far beyond the hurt and the pain that you'll endure. We endure a lot of hurt and pain just simply because we obey God, right? And he's saying the reward, the harvest that comes, the blessing that comes so outweighs the hurt and the struggles, the sacrifices we make in this life now. It's more than worth it. It's more than worth it. Now, saying all this, let me, let me add one thing here. Uh, Jesus said, you know, on that day, there will many be who say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. Yeah, there's, there's those who will be those wolves in sheep's clothing. They'll act as if they've humbled themselves before him, that he is their savior and their Lord, and Jesus will say, depart from me, I never knew you. So, <coughs> excuse me, it's easy for us to fool ourselves, right? And so this is why we are vigilant. We, we are diligent. We press forward. We strive forward, as the Apostle Paul said, right? We, we press forward. We strive forward. We make it our aim, our goal, not just to drift through life now. I got my ticket to heaven, Right? Right? We make it our aim to work out our salvation, right? to confirm the calling, the election on our lives. Right? We make it our aim right? to, as, Paul, as James said, look, faith without works is dead. It's no faith at all. Faith in Jesus shows itself in the works of love. So let's go on now at verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others... But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. So now he, he kind of steps back a little bit, and now he's going to address the, the believers there in Corinth uh, specifically again about uh, their relationship with him and about what that guy was saying behind Paul's back to them. So he says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Knowing the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord? Well, the scripture says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, first of all, the fear of the Lord is he is the judge of all the earth. I will stand before him one day. 
The books will be opened. I will be judged. Have I humbly cried out to him for mercy? Have I humbly looked to Jesus, put my faith in him? Have I humbly submitted my life to him as my Lord, my King? Or have I arrogantly, pridefully rejected him, saying, I don't need a Savior, I don't need a God? The fear of the Lord says, what he says he will do, he will do. Depart from me into the outer darkness. Depart from me, in other words, into hell. First of all, the fear of the Lord, the beginning of wisdom, is I will stand before God one day and I will have a destination of heaven or hell. I will have a destination of eternal life with God and all of his goodness or eternal life in outer darkness, eternal life with no blessing, no goodness, eternal life in misery. Because I, I, turn, I hatefully rejected him. I hatefully said, I will be my own God. That's the fear of the Lord. But here Paul's saying, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, beyond that, the fear of the Lord is this. And God means everything that he says. And God will do everything that he says. And when God says, I will chasten those whom I love, right? When God says, I will discipline, I will chasten those whom I love, the fear of the Lord is, yeah, he will. I, I, he knows that I'm looking to him. He knows I've put my faith in Jesus and he loves me and he will chasten me. He will lay me low when I'm disobeying him, when I'm not doing what he tells me to do. And as it says in the book of Hebrews, when he's talking about exactly that, how he chastens those whom he loves, he says, remember, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. I don't want his chastening on my life. So he says, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing that, and, and here, you know what he's just said beforehand, knowing that even as one who has put my faith in Jesus, I will receive from him, you know, what is due for what has been done in the body. So knowing all of that, he says, we persuade others. He says, knowing all of this, I make it my goal for others to know all of this. I make it my goal to persuade others of the truth of all of this. And, you know, as, as Paul is uh, writing here to this group of Christians in Corinth, he's, he's seeking to persuade them that what's being said to them, look, if you're really a godly person, if you really have faith, if you really know how to pray, you won't have big problems in your life. He's seeking to persuade them that's a lie. Because I know the fear of the Lord. I know that God's called me to, to, to write this letter. He's called me to reach to you, not just to say, oh, well, a bunch of losers that just believe in some big lie. He's saying, no, the fear of the Lord is God is telling me to speak to you, to persuade your heart. And also, knowing the fear of the Lord, that you will stand before him. You will be judged by him. I am seeking to persuade you of the truth. He says, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. He's saying, now what that guy is saying about me, now here he starts talking about himself. Now he says, what that guy is saying about me, he says, doesn't really matter. Doesn't really matter as far as I, for me, he says, because who I am is, is known to God. Who I am is, is known to God. That guy saying, I, I don't have faith, I don't know how to pray, I must not be a godly man. Well, he can say it, but who I really am is known to God. If somebody's trash-talking behind your back, right, somebody's trash-talking to your face, right, what you are is known to God. That's what matters. That's what matters. It doesn't matter what they are saying about you. You know, as a, a pastor, right, I put myself out there over and over and over. I stand before whole big groups of people. I'm putting myself out there all the time. And oh, yeah, I've learned after 40 years now of being a pastor, yeah, people are talking behind my back all the time. All the time, right? I've been in this county 35 years. Oh, I know, people are talking behind my back all the time. And by the way, the Bible says, you know, when you talk behind somebody's back, you can be sure that what you said will eventually get to that person. 
<laughs> That's true too, right? So, so what have I had to learn? doesn't matter what they're saying. Who I am is known to God. Who you are is known to God. doesn't matter what they're saying. So he says, but what we are, he always says we, meaning he and those who are traveling with him, right? And he says, uh, what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. I hope you're not believing what that guy says about me. Because if you start believing what that guy says to me, you're going to believe the lie that's behind it all. In other words, the lie that if you're a real godly person, you won't have trouble in your life. And if you believe that, then eventually the troubles in your life are going to become so big because they become big in everyone's life, and then you'll say, this God stuff must not be real. Or you'll say, I must not have faith in Jesus. So he says, I hope it is known also who I am to your conscience. At verse 12, he says, we are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. So he's saying, uh, kind of repeating himself again here, but he takes it to a, a new point at the end of that long sentence. He says, look, we're not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us. Now, what was his boasting, right? Paul said, okay, you want me to boast? You're boasting about your perfect life without problems. I'll boast to you about all my problems. In other words, I'll tell you. That's how we would say, I'll tell you. I'll tell you about my problems. I'll tell you about the struggles that I've had. And I'll tell you about how God has used those struggles and those problems to do a great work in me and to work through me in the lives of others. He's saying, so I'm hoping that by me, he's writing to the Christians in Corinth here, saying, I'm hoping that by me writing these things to you about all my problems and about what God, how God has used them, taken the problems in my, that have come to me and used them for great good in me and through me in the lives of others, I hope that's the storyline you'll, you'll tell. I hope that's what you'll talk about, how God takes the struggles of this world, and if I'm putting my faith in him, I'm putting my faith in Jesus, then he's going to turn around whatever problems and struggles I endure and work them for great good in my life. And then Paul goes at the end of that, verse 12 then, that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. He's saying, now what that guy's talking about behind my back, he's talking about outward appearance. He's painting a picture for you of himself, right? He's painting a picture of outward appearance. Look at my life. I don't have these problems. I pray them away. Right? He's, he's painting a, a picture of outward appearance, right? And boasting about his outward appearance, in other words, the circumstances of life. Look how God has just blessed me with such wonderful circumstances in my life. Boasting about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. And not about what is in the heart. Whoo! That's deep right there. That's, take that second half of verse 12 and meditate and meditate and meditate on that. How often, for example, do I look at persons? One person has wonderful outward appearance. I'm not talking about the appearance of their body necessarily. Just the circumstances of one person's life seems to be wonderful. And wow, wow. And the outward appearance, the circumstances of another person's life seems to be, wow, man, that's, that's sad or that's, ooh, that's, mm, that's not good. But what's, what's God telling us right here? The, the real, what's really important is not the outward circumstance of someone's life. It's what's in the heart. It's what's going on in the heart. And see, this is what I've learned through all these years of being a pastor. Is that very, very often, persons whose circumstances, just like Paul, the outward circumstances of Paul's life, and as we discover by the end of this letter of 2 Corinthians, he has some thorn in the flesh. And we know he writes elsewhere, I know, he says, my appearance is a trial to you. So uh, he has, we think it was an eye disease that was even, you know, looked awful. Picture maybe some news account you've seen of 
someplace in some very poor part of the world and somebody has some awful eye disease and they're going blind and it looks awful on their face. So Paul is saying, look, the outward appearance even of my body and the outward appearance of my circumstances, not great at all. But I want you to look at what's going on in my heart. And see, this is what I've learned as a pastor through all these years. Sometimes the persons who the outward appearance of circumstance and even body looks kind of sad and not, you know, not perfect and wonderful. But what's going on in their heart is so far beyond sometimes the person whose outward appearance, outward circumstances look wonderful and great. And so we are always looking at the heart, always looking at the heart. It's hard to look at the heart, isn't it? To look at the heart, you have to look at the person's life, not just a glimpse, a snapshot of their life, not just the, the show of their life. But you have to watch and watch and watch. And we're looking for the heart. And so Paul is saying that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. Well, what is going on in your heart? That's what counts. That's what matters. Whether the outward appearance of your life, the outward circumstance of your life is, quote, great or, quote, not great. It's what's going on in your heart that counts. Are you becoming a person who loves and loves and loves? Are you becoming a person who forgives? Are you becoming a person of kindness? Remember when Jesus was in the temple that time and people were coming and putting their offering in the the offering container, right? We have offering boxes here at, at Mount Zion. So Jesus and his disciples are sitting now. We have to picture not like church here, big, big temple complex and people coming and going, right? And Jesus and his disciples are sitting near the offering box, right? And some people are putting a lot of money in there. And then this poor widow, this poor widow comes up and puts one little coin in there, right? And Jesus says, disciples, she has put in more than all the rest of them. Yeah, because he was looking into her heart, into her heart. He wasn't looking at the clothing she was wearing. She wasn't looking at the amount of money that she put in the offering. He was looking into her heart. Wow. I have sometimes sat, not just sometimes, often sat and, and talked with persons who've had a whole lot of brokenness in their lives whole lot of brokenness, right? And then they start telling me some story. And I see a depth of love in that story. A depth of love in that story. And I wonder, do I have that much love in my heart? Do I have that much love in my heart that I would do what this person is telling me, the story about what this person is doing or, or did? Now, from outward appearance, people would look at Pastor Craig, the pastor, and say, woo, what a godly person, right? Well, I don't know if that's what they'd say, but some people would say that, right? Look at outward appearance. But I'm looking at the heart of that person and saying, wow, wow. And so Jesus said one time, the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is an incredible word for us an incredible word for us that um, outward appearance means nothing. All right, we're going to stop right there at verse 12. We will pick it up at verse 13 uh, next week. And um, these are just amazing scriptures, amazing scriptures. Uh, you know, still thinking about that, that verse 12. Let me just say this. Jesus said, to whom much is given of him, much is required. To whom much is given of him, much is required. I know so much has been given to me in my life. Right? I know that. And therefore, much is required of me. And sometimes I look at persons to whom much wasn't given. And yet I see a depth of love there, a depth of faith there. Wow, wow. So if you are a person to whom much has been given, then know this, of you much is required, right? Pursue the Lord with everything in you. Pursue him, right? 
Jesus' disciples one time said, well, who then, be, can, who then can be saved, right? He said, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And there, the disciples thinking about outward appearance say, well, who then can be saved? Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So if I have a person to whom much has been given, therefore much is required, I'm like, um, but with God, all things are possible. All right, these are amazing words. Let's, uh, let's pray. We'll pick it up next week. Again, go to our Bible study, I mean our website, mzpraise.org. Click Bible study. You'll find all the Bible studies right there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Your word is amazing. The truths of your word are so deep, incredible. And we ask, Lord God, that you would speak to our hearts in deep, powerful ways. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray that you would help us to apply these things in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, Mount Zion. See you soon.